I want to begin with a little warning before I actually uh, start the message. What I'm going to be sharing with you is very likely familiar, and maybe sometimes that familiarity will breed a little contempt, and you think, oh, I already got this. And I just want to warn you <laughs> that I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you that you will pay close attention, even if it seems familiar with you, okay? Now, I want to read from the book of Romans, uh, chapter 10. I'm going to begin with verse 16 and just read a couple of verses. They're familiar. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. How many have heard that verse before? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let me just point out something that we might think it says, but it actually doesn't. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. No, faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. When you begin to hear God's voice, when you have hearing and you're sensitive to God's voice, faith, faith rises up when you're sensitive to that. If I, if I might just take another passage of Scripture, and the ones who uh, assemble with me on Wednesday night will be familiar with this, here's probably the, one of the most misapplied, out-of-context passages that we ever use in Christianity. It's found in the book of John. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. Unless you want to check my context, verse 31, it says, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I bet there's nobody here that probably hasn't heard that, even in a political scene. The truth will make you free. But that's not what it says in context. In the context, it says, if you condemn. In other words, there's a condition attached to this promise. If you continue in my word, then you're truly my disciples. You're the genuine article. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's not information that makes you free. It's activating the word of God, which you've already heard. And I want to talk to you about faith comes by hearing and how important the role of God's word is in that. And I want to share with you that there's a, a scripture in Psalm 19, 119, I should say. There's many scriptures there. It's the largest chapter in the entire Bible. And it's focused around the value of God's word. He uses the, issue, he uses the word word. He uses the word commandments, statues, law. But it's all about God's word and how valuable it is. David recognized how precious the word of God was. It was for him, he says, a treasure. You have any treasures? I have a few of them. One of the things, I, I was just jotting down a few treasures uh, that, that have impacted my life. Probably one of the greatest treasures in this life, I'm not talking about the spiritual qualities or anything, is the treasure of my parents. Now, I realize not everybody can say that. But I was really blessed with that, an incredible treasure in my parents. They left me an incredible legacy. I remember not too long before my father passed, my dad, I asked him to speak to the men of our, the church that I previously served. And he began to share with those men that he was the richest man he knew. And the reason for his riches was this. He says, I have two children, and they're both serving God. I have six grandkids, and they're serving God. You can't get richer than that. Now, we think of riches in material realm, but I'll tell you, there's something about the treasure of having a family that's following God. Now, we may not have that yet, but we can work toward that but we have to exemplify to the rest of our family what is truly important, 
What is a treasure? Some of the things I valued growing up was special time with my family. What was interesting was my dad came and mom came from a generation where they weren't real affectionate. Anybody understand that? It wasn't that they didn't love us. They really loved us, but they just didn't show it physically. They weren't Italian, you know? And uh, we're mongrel in nature, my family. We're mixed breed, you might say. But one thing I noticed, and it's odd that I would remember this to me, is that whenever I got sick, when my dad would come home, he would give me all kinds of special attention and focus. I treasured that. I, I, that was valuable to me. Another thing I think of as in growing up is my, my parents would always meet with a group from our family. And when I say our family, I'm not talking about just physical family. There were people in that family from the church as well. And we would go out every weekend. And one of the guys had, a, had built a boat. So we went water skiing together. I just enjoyed being with my family. I treasured that time growing up. There was a lot of things that I treasured. Uh, special times that we didn't have stores very close, but certain times of the year, there was an ice cream store in the little town of Easton, Maine that would open up on Sunday nights. And before we would go to the evening service, Dad would, Mom would often swing by and we would have ice cream together. You can tell I'm treasuring that still. I treasured those things. They're, they're valuable. But some of the more important things that I treasured was I, I treasured how my mom and dad valued or treasured God's people. My dad, when he was blessed, he, he was given a, a new car. Uh, and I remember dad being willing to take that car and drive across the town and pick up elderly and young people who had no means to get to church because he treasured people. So I saw that when I was growing up, how my dad treasured people that were not part of his family, but part of the family of the house of God. I treasured how they valued meeting together with a local assembly, with a local church. My, my mom and dad set aside, truly they had, you might say, a Sabbath. And on that day... Sports were never an issue for them. Going and recreating was not an issue for them. That day, we belonged in church. And I grew up with a heritage that my parents said, on Sunday, we don't do shopping, we don't do these other things, but we definitely do church. Sometimes, I didn't always appreciate that as a child. As a matter of fact, you know, I really was upset that I didn't get to see the Ed Sullivan show or the Smothers Brothers. Anybody remember them? Some of, I'm, I know I'm aging myself right now, but those were shows I never got to see growing up. Now, thank God for TV land. We got them back. I caught up on a few of them. But the thing that stood out to me is how they treasured taking me to church on Sunday. And then they would take me early Sunday night because we had about an hour youth group prior to our evening service. Then we had the evening service. Sometimes it was late. And one of the things that I noticed that my dad would do is if my sister and I, if we fell asleep, they would carry us from the car to our beds. Sometimes I faked it. just so dad would carry me. I treasured those times of him carrying me as a child. It's, it's strange how you remember little things like that from growing up. My mom and dad always took a nap on Sunday afternoon after service. I have copied that. Not just on Sundays sometimes. But they, they would always be at home on Sunday. Now, I was allowed to go play ball or watch TV or whatever and do whatever I wanted during those times, but I had to respect their rest. They treasured the value of God. I remember when I was a teenager and we had moved to Connecticut. We lived in Bristol, and I got my first job. I was really, really excited. 
But one of the things that not my parents, but myself, said to the people that were hiring me at McDonald's, because I worked at the McDonald's on Route 6, and I said to them, I have to have Friday nights off because it's youth group. And I have to have Sunday off because we spend the day at our church in Hartford. We went to church in Hartford. And that was my value that had become, it had become my value because it was my parents' values. And so, guess what? The first time they posted my hours, I was scheduled to work Friday night and Sunday. So I went to my superior, I went to my boss, and I says, I'm sorry, I'm not working Friday night or Sunday. Well, they said, this is just your first week. Why don't you just work this one week, then after that we'll let you have it. I said, no. I had to learn at a young age that there was a value in getting together with other young people. And I set aside and even risked at that time my job. Now, I didn't lose my job. Guess what? When I stood up, they adjusted the schedule. And when they adjusted the schedule, anytime they ever tried to do it again, they knew they were going to get confronted with the same issue. And I was really blessed because I had a job that I made $1.60 an hour. Now I'm really aging myself. But that wasn't my first job. My first job was picking potatoes, and I got 25 cents a barrel. I thought I was rich. But my parents valued and treasured work, and they put me in the fields. Listen, I think sometimes we coddle our little ones a little too much, and we don't teach them what's really valuable. My grandpa, when I was 10 years old, he says, I need somebody to get on the tractor behind me and sit on the mower and lift the blade. And he taught me the value of work. When I came home from that job that day, I told my mom, I'm never going to be a farmer. It's too hard. The reality, and I know you've heard some of these stories that I've shared with you before, but the reality, I want you to understand that when your parents treasure something, you tend to treasure it. So if you treasure entertainment, your kids are going to be whacked over the top with it. And, but if you treasure God, they will, they will eventually reflect that. And so I, I, I treasured these things. I, I remember because after three months... I got a job for two bucks an hour cleaning factories. Whew, I was excited. And so I told, I, I, I turned in my notice for two weeks at my job. And they says, we'll give you a buck 80. I said, no way. I'm out of here. And I treasured the principle of work and responsibility because of the pattern that my parents laid down. You know, it says, train up a child in the way that he should go. That word train is kind of like putting down ruts so that you, you just naturally follow them. So that was an important, the work ethic. They're, they're loyalty to a local body. My parents never shopped church. They sought God, found where they belonged, and stayed there. And it wasn't always good. Even when there was a pastor engaged in immorality. They hung in there and helped the church get through that because that was their family. They were loyal to the body of Christ. They had balanced wisdom in their life. My dad had some times of prosperity in farming, but he never went over the top when it came to Christmas. He really was very cautious about giving us too much because he knew it might impact us in a negative way. They were generous but cautious. My mom treasured music, so she thought I should have piano lessons. I told her I don't want to go to piano lessons because my teacher has bad breath. <laughs> but I... She forced me to take piano lessons, and I took them for years, and I didn't have the gift. It wasn't part of my nature. So when I got to Bristol, Connecticut, and I said to my mom, if you let me play slide trombone, can I give up the piano? <laughs> and she agreed to that. She allowed me. But I value music. I value worship music 
in particular. And my mom gave me that. And I know this isn't maybe seemingly related, but I have a musical appreciation of music that I don't particularly love. Very ish. My, I grew up, you know, in a context of country music. And I liked it. But when I got older, my mom went to the grocery store. Now, this is really, I, some of you might understand this, but when she went to the grocery store, if she bought a certain amount of goods, she got albums. Anybody remember that? Pastor, Pastor Thomas. Symphony music. So I developed appreciation for that because it was part of my life. But I like any kind of music almost. Almost anything you can name, I really enjoy it. But mostly, I treasured the faithfulness to God that my parents demonstrated in the spiritual disciplines that God gives us. Pastor John has really been giving of himself and of recent messages especially to get us grounded in God's word, to get us grounded in a culture that is going crazy so that we won't be tossed to and fro by the winds of lawlessness. Jesus warns us that in the last days, lawlessness is going to multiply. We shouldn't be surprised for it, but we should be rooted in the rock. And here's another misquoted scripture. What's the rock? Nobody dares to say. <laughs> it's, Jesus is our rock, that's true, but the rock that Jesus taught us about being grounded in words so our house don't fall it's obedience to the word of God it's not it's not simply having invited Jesus in but you must embrace his word value his word treasure his word I want to talk this morning about hope in a hopeless world a few more things that I treasured I treasured my spouse When I got married, we moved away from home, and guess what I did? We found a local church and stayed there. I felt God led us there. We treasured our time. I was committed to that church, served in that church. I was only 20 years old. My wife was almost 19 when we got married. But then there came a time when we thought we were going to have our first child, and she lost a child and had uterine cancer and the doctors made this statement that she, if we didn't get treatment she'd likely be dead in nine months my wife was even trying to find me someone to replace her when I when she passed I says I don't want anybody else there's nobody else like you oh I still feel that way I treasured my spouse. I treasure my children. They're a heritage from the Lord. My wife treasured her engagement ring. She was pretty excited when she got it, and she was pretty sad when one day she took the kids to Page Park in Bristol. We were living in Southington at the time. She came back and noticed that the stone in her engagement ring was gone. So I encouraged her. I says, I know it's kind of crazy, but maybe you could go back to the park and see if it fell out there on the grass or in the sand. I don't know. Probably not going to find it, but you can go look. She drove back to the park with her friend, and they looked around the park everywhere. Couldn't find that stone. Drove back to the church again to tell me that she couldn't find it. Opened the door, and it sat right there on the ground. God answered her prayers because that was emotionally significant to her. It wasn't the great value. I didn't have much money. I was kind of cheap. <laughs> Another day, years later, we had gotten it fixed, but evidently the prongs were a little weak. I came home from the church to find my wife crying. I said, what's the matter? She says, I was working up in the bedroom and I just looked down and I noticed my, my diamond was gone. I says, don't worry, we're going to find it. God helped you last time, he'll help you this time. 
She says, I looked everywhere in the bedroom. It's not there. I, I, I looked everywhere I was working. I cannot find it. I walked up, stood next to the bed, looked down, and saw something glitter. And sure enough, the stone was there. So we found a better jeweler. <laughs> and this time, it's still in her ring to this day. You treat things differently that you treasure. When we went to the Philippines, we spent 13 months. One of the things that we treasured there was the culture, how they cared for one another, how they would sacrifice in order to serve their neighbors, and, and the, the friendliness and the warmth of the culture. We treasured that. But you know what? When I landed in New York City, I treasured my country. I said, we don't realize how good we have it. We had another opportunity, and my wife and I traveled to Haiti. When I got back, I sure treasured my country. We went to Russia. When I got off the plane coming back from Russia, I almost wanted to get out in New York City and kiss the ground. And when that guy that passed me through the customs greeted me and smiled and said, welcome home, Oh, I wanted to cry. I treasure my country. That's why I pray for them. I pray for our leaders and things. And people probably know this already, and I might cry, but I rarely do that. I treasure my grandkids. There's a little guy next door to me his name is Jalason. I hear him cry. I get so excited. If, if, if mama invites us in and I get to go see him, I talk to him, he smiles at me. Because I, I teach my grandkids how to smile. That's my gift to them. And talk to them. But when I hear mama and daddy in there, and I hear them too on occasion say, Oh, you're so beautiful. You're the most beautiful baby in the world. I know that they treasure that child. And they treasure their, their other children. And I treasure all my grandkids. When, when my daughter says to me, your, your granddaughter, Gina, is leaving a $93,000 scholarship at the University of Man, Miami to go and pay for a ministry school. I went, what? And then I said, I treasure that. And she was at the point where she was willing to give up her flute and piccolo, which she had become very well known on and, and, and played. She gets hired every year in Miami. Even though she's not part of the school, she gets hired to play uh, piccolo in the Sousa Band, Miami Sousa Band. They pay her to do that. But this past week, she pulled out her flute again after a long time of not really playing and got to play at a Christian ladies' conference in front of 2,500 people. But you know what? I don't treasure her any more than her brother. But I treasure that my children and grandchildren are serving the Lord. That's important to me. But there's one thing that's more important than anything else to me. I treasure God's word. When I was a very young man, my parents valued God's word. But when I got married, I was on my own as far as God's word was concerned. I couldn't rely on the Sunday school that I'd grown up in. and I'd learned several stories from the Bible, but I realized suddenly when I was married that I really didn't have a good understanding. I knew stories of David and Goliath. I knew the three Hebrew ch children in the furnace, which we alluded to in worship today. I knew about Jesus. I knew about the Apostle Paul. But you asked me where they occurred in the biblical account of history. I couldn't get it. And I started reading because I treasured the Word of God and I realized I was missing something in my life. And I began to devour God's Word. I stuck a Bible in my pocket when I went to work, when I had break, whenever I had lunch. I would spend time reading the Word of God. 
And I began to read systematically. And as I developed it, then I started a class so that I could teach kids the systematic structure of God's Word. I valued it. I wanted kids to grow up getting what I didn't get in church, and that was a systematic understanding of how history unfolded in the Word of God. And that hunger led me to a place where I was willing to give up my job, got laid off, that helped too, but I ended up going to Bible college. But I did not come to Bible college to become a pastor or to learn how to preach. I came because I was starved for the Word of God. I wanted to know God's word. There was hardly, I had historic uh, classes, you know, the history of the New Testament, history of the Old Testament. And I remember in one New Testament class, I can't remember if it was a specific book or not because it's quite some time ago that I went to Bible college. I remember I would have questions and I would, after everybody's on their way to the chapel and headed to the service and celebration and everything, I'd be still asking the teacher questions. I wanted to learn the Word of God. I treasured it. It was a value. Listen, in context of the culture and the drift that's going on in our lives today, we need to again treasure God's Word. And it's not enough to be familiar. It's not enough to just come to church and hear it there. You need it daily. You, and I'm, I'm not making a suggestion. I'm, I'm telling you, there are no options. You say, well, Pastor, I'm not really a good reader. You're looking at somebody here that is a terrible reader. But we have Bibles in our devices now. We are blessed in this country. On our phones, I got a Bible. And my phone has become one of my best Bibles. There's like 20-some Bibles on my phone just by going to YouVerse. And you can, you can get to the Word of God. It's readily available. But in a time when the Word of God is readily available, available, we treasure other things. We treasure our careers. We treasure sports. Listen, I love sports. Last night, I watched the last quarter or so of the Yukon game. Go, Yukon. And I watched that guy, what's his name? Dominic Klingon? Yeah. Man, he did good. You know why I like to watch basketball? Because I can't play it. I told, I told my son when he was, you know, in his teenagers, I used to go out and play basketball with him. I said, I can't play with you anymore. He said, why? I says, you cheat. He says, what do you mean, Dad? I don't cheat. I says, you run, you jump, you dribble. That to me is cheating. I can't do that anymore. I played with some kids here just a little while ago. I guess Nick might have been there and Herb, he, they were out there. My job was to stand near the basket, put it in. Didn't do it very well because I don't really treasure basketball. I enjoy those things, but they're not my treasure. I know this may seem a bit redundant and difficult to hear but can I tell you that we're living in a time when we have to, again, treasure God's word. Please go with me to Acts chapter 2. I want to just show you a church that was vibrant in its beginning and was doing amazingly well. And it tells us in this chapter, in chapter 2, that when the church started, that they were having this incredible revival. Everybody was in awe. How many would like to have a church where you walk in and you're in awe? Didn't you? That's what, see, that's what Herb was sensing, the presence of God, the awe of God in this house. Feeling a sense of awe. Signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. Those who believed were gathered together. They had all things in common. They, were be, they began selling their property and sharing their possessions and with everyone. There was no need in the church at the time. Day by day, they were continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were taking meals together with gladness of heart, praising God, having favor with God and the people, and the Lord was adding to the... Wouldn't you like to be a part of that church? Well, I tell you, there's a reason for that. We have to back up to verse 42. Well, actually, you should back up to about verse 37. And I won't, I won't get into the details of, of that. But in 37, they're pierced because of Peter's message. They ask, what do we do? Peter calls them to repentance and being baptized. Baptism is a consequence of a decision to receive Christ. 
That's why we don't do it with children because they're not capable of making a decision at that point in time. But when they heard this word, they were convicted. And he says, repent, turn to God, be baptized, receive forgiveness of sins, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He talks about the promise. He talks about the danger of this perverse and evil generation. Turn away from it. And it says, everybody who heard the word was baptized. And there were added that day 3,000 people to the church. Verse 42 says this. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. May I challenge you this morning that we are unable to have that kind of devotion a lot of times because we're devoted to something else. And aren't willing to take that stand and say, I need to be at youth group. I need to be in church. I need to be in the word of God every single morning. I can't afford to leave my house until I have prayed and I have the favor of God in my life. And I know this may come across, you know, I've been here long enough, I can be a little mean and get away with it. It may come across as being mean, maybe even legalistic. It's not legalistic. It's called discipline. Don't confuse discipline with legalism. You see, legalism says you have to do this to be saved. You have to have your hair. Right now I would be in violation of a lot of churches. My beard's too bushy, too white. You should have shaved it off. You know, we have all these rules to make people safe, but the reality is there are things you need to devote yourself to to be healthy. And if we want a healthy, growing, vibrant church full of the presence of God, the power of God, isn't it fascinating that when these people embrace these devotions, it says God was doing miracles through the apostles. And it attributes to this. Let me read it for you. It says here in verse 42, uh, 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Let me just mention a couple of things. Devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching was devoting themselves to the word of God. So they came together regularly to hear the word of God. Thank God you value. You're here this morning because you come for for the word of God, right? But they were also devoted to fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia. It comes from the word koine. And the word koine has to do with steadfast partnership, belonging. Belonging. This is not coffee and donuts. Fellowship is not coffee. It's partnering, realizing you're on the same team. One of the things I enjoyed about watching that basketball game toward the end, well, when, when UConn won, I enjoyed that. Even though I don't really care if they, if they didn't win, I wouldn't have cried like I do over my grandchildren. But I saw how they played as a team. Donovan wasn't interested in dominating the game as much as participating in the team. He passed the ball to other people, and they played as a team. It was a team effort that makes them so good. Not an individual. Yes, you need good individuals. You need valuable people and things like that. We got wonderful people in this church, but we need the team. Everybody participating. Everybody involved. Everybody engaged. Everybody here. You still smiling? If I was Pastor John, I'd say, are you with me? (laughs) Listen. Listen. They were continually devoting. This, this word, it's one Greek word. It really means steadfastly committed. They, they were like me when it came to youth group. You can sign me up, but I ain't going because I'm at youth group. You see, if you had that kind of a mentality in your youth, we would have a vibrant ministry. If you had that, but you can't ask that of your children if you're not doing that yourself. Because what you treasure, they'll treasure. If you treasure their career, they'll get a good job, maybe get a good paying job, but they may not treasure Jesus Christ. So everyone kept feeling this sense of awe. Let me 
Also, go to uh, 2 Timothy, an, uh, another familiar passage that I'm sure, please go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 because we're living these times. Uh, one of our sisters asked me, what's the title of the message? Faith comes by hearing. But hearing comes by the word of God. Your ability to hear God's voice comes when you get familiar with his word. See, the reality is, I've used this illustration before, but when my dad and myself and my son all lived in the same home, most people, when they called, they didn't know who it was. But if my wife called, she would know if it was me, my dad, or my son, because she's familiar with our voice. Are you familiar with God's voice? Can you distinguish it from the voices of this world? There's a lot of voices that are interesting out there. They're fascinating, good things, great philosophers, but I want to hear the voice of God himself. Realize this. Timothy, Paul says to his son in the faith. This is what he's concerned about with this young man. He says, realize this. This is 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. King James says, perilous times. Don't you think we're, we're already there? I think so. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, gossips, none here, thank God, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness. They're, they're religious people. They're nice people, some of them although they have denied its power. Religious people that don't know the power of God, you need to stay away from them. And I'm not saying that we live in isolation. Please, this monasticism doesn't work either. That whole idea of isolating yourself and living in our four walls. No, we have to live in this world. But there is a sense in which we value the voice of God. We value what comes from the people of God. But he says, people that are engaged, but they're not living out the word, the power of God isn't in them to transform their nature. He says, you need to get away from those people that are bad influence. It's better for you to be in the world, and they admit it, than being in church where they are living that way. Oh, man. I might be riding home alone. Psalms chapter 1, I won't go there, but I want to reference it. You can write it down if you want. But he says, we'll be like a tree. The blessed man is like a tree planted by the living waters, rivers of living water. That's spiritual disciplines. That is the multiple of resources that take the word of God and cause it to come into our hearts. He said, planted by streams of, not one stream, I'm planted in the church. That's a stream for me. When whoever's leading worship here, that's one of the streams I'm receiving in that hour. There were things that were said in our worship time. There were things that were sung, I should say, in our worship time that have made a residence in my heart. <coughs> Excuse me. I treasure them. But that's just one stream. There's Bible studies, smaller groups that I want to get into. We're having small groups. You should be a part of that. Get into a smaller group where you can get focused. We have, we have a small group kind of here, a little over 20 people here last. We had an amazing time praying for each other's concerns at the end of that time. It was just a powerful time in the Lord. I was blessed. I went home encouraged. I'm, I have a neighbor. He doesn't know G Jesus in the way that we do, but we prayed for him anyway because of his condition that he's going through. Streams. There's another stream. I have in my study a deacon's bench. Anybody know what a deacon's bench is? Neither do I. But that's what they call it. It's a little wooden bench. But I have a couple pillows on it because at my age, your knees aren't what they used to be. You know what I'm saying? And I lay it there in front of that deacon's bench, and that's where I kneel before my God. And I meet with him every single day. 
another spiritual discipline, another stream wherein I receive. Prayer is an incredible discipline. It's saying, Lord, I lack. You got what I need. It's humbling. It's humbling. The Word of God. I go to the Word of God. I spend time. Sometimes I'll get so fascinated with the Word, I'll be end up reading chapters and chapters because the Word just begins to nurture me. I also study to minister to the, to the people, but I don't do that. I personally feed myself at first. Before I feed you, I've been eating well. People say, well, that's obvious you're eating well. You know? I know what you're saying. All right, I want to go to another passage of Scripture in James. This will be the last one. James. Well, I shouldn't say that because if the Lord prompts me, I want to be available. Chapter 1. But James chapter 1 is my last intended verse, verse, series of verses. I want to look at James chapter 1. He's talking about the value of trials and the benefits that can be received, how we can grow in Christ, not to be weary about it. Every good thing comes from God. Every bad thing comes from the enemy. He tells us not to be deceived. But he says here in, let me see, verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. Man, that's a whole sermon right there. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. If there was ever a culture that's quick to anger, it's this one. We're an angry people here in America at times. Because it goes on to explain, it says, verse 20, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So that means there are times when I'm watching the news that my wife turns to me and says, time to turn it off. Because a little anger might be coming to the surface. Am I alone in that? You ever get angry about what you're seeing on the news or what you're seeing on TV or whatever? Therefore, he says in verse 21, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the what? The word implanted. Which is able to save your souls. There is a difference between the word memorized and the word implanted. I was sharing a while back, I can't remember the context, but... I've been in a lot of places where their parents were excellent at teaching their kids to memorize Scripture, but they really had no clue what it meant, and they were the meanest, nastiest kids you ever saw in your life. Information doesn't bring about transformation unless it's applied. So what I'm encouraging here this morning is that you won't just get into the Word but you're asking God that you will be able to apply it. He says, putting aside all filthiness that remains of the wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to, only the implanted word, but prove yourselves, and he clarifies, prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks in the natural face in his mirror, for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Are there anybody here that wants to be blessed in whatever you do? then you need to receive the word implanted. What does it mean? You not only hear it, you apply it. You do it. Because if you don't apply the word, it's like looking in a mirror and walking away and forgetting. Now, I'm not real good at coordinating clothes. Everybody's well aware of that. So what I'm wearing today, if you don't like it, blame my wife. She picked it out for me. Her and Carlene, I think they did, they were conspiring yesterday because it's green. Marianne, just telling you. 
So the reality is, I look in the mirror, but my problem is, I don't much care. <laughs> so I don't look very long. Oh, yeah, I still have a little hair left. Thank God. Walk away. I walk away, and my wife says, your collar is this. You need to check your belt. It's a little too snug. Maybe you need... When she gets done, I look different. At least people say I do. Hopefully I look better. And I believe the church of Jesus Christ would look a lot better if they spent some time in the mirror of God's word. In the mirror. You know what? Mirror helps you to see your what? Yourself. If anyone's a hearer of a word and not a doer, he's like a man that looks in the natural face of his mirror. Once he's looked at it, he's gone away, and he says, boy, how that applies to so-and-so. Boy, they, so-and-so should really read this. Oh, you know that, that lady there in church? Well, she should pay attention to this. Maybe we'd be better off spending some time in God's word adjusting ourselves. Get rooted and get implanted. There is absolutely, in my opinion, no excuse for not being planted by the streams of living water. Prayer, worship, in the word, connected to the people of God. I can tell you over the course of my life, I faced some tragic things. My wife and I, when she was dying of cancer at the time that that I told you about a little earlier. It was the body of Christ that got us through. Is that true, hon? It was the body of Christ. I was part of a Bible school, and we were had, we had great Bible study, great instruction. I'm receiving it every day. You think, I don't need to go to church. Oh, yes, I did. And in that church family, the people who were a part of that small family, they connected with us and got us through a really dark time in our lives where my wife suffered from cancer. There was a time at school, everybody, what was it? Well, this is pretty much all the time. They knew me because I was married to her. And she was well known because of the cancer that she battled and what she was going through. That wasn't the end of our life. That was the beginning of our life. And let me tell you, I can, whether it be the Philippines when we served there, Bosnia, when we went to visit there, Russia, when we went there, the body of Christ is critical. And you might be able to receive a word online, but you're not connected unless you're meeting with people, unless you're connecting and absorbing. There's something about it. When I walk in here, there are people that I look at before I go to speak a message, and they know what I'm going to say. Mark, you're one of them. You know that, right? I, he came in. He said, anything you need, Pastor? I said, you know. He says, I sure do. Pray for me. I feel very inadequate in coming to the pulpit all the time. But I believe that when people stand with you in prayer, God equips you. And I need my brothers. I needed Winston to pray with me today. I need him to put me, his arm around me. And Pastor Ken, we're going to pray together. And when we do that, there comes that sense of the presence and the power of God. And I just want you to understand something today. I'm not speaking this word to condemn anybody. I want to rescue you. I want there to be hope for the hopeless. And if you're not in the word on a regular basis, then you need to start somewhere. Start with 15 minutes. Every day, open the Bible and read a scripture. If you need help and guidance, one of the pastors can help you. But today, we must make a commitment to looking into the mirror. I know that as you get older, it ain't any prettier. Isn't it amazing that at 71 years of age, which I will be pretty soon, I can look in the mirror and still see a lot of flaws. And I say, Lord, help me. So I go to the other discipline, prayer. And I say, God, help me to apply this word. And I utilize the Lord's prayer in Matthew chapter 6 as kind of a guide for me. 
I don't know, you can you can do however you're comfortable with, but you need to meet with God regularly in prayer, the word things. And I want to, if you're a parent today, I just want to encourage you. Thank God you brought your children. When I was young, and please, I, I'm not condemning anybody or anything like this, but one of the things that when I was young, I really noticed and it really scared me was parents disciplining their kids by saying, you're not going to youth group today because you're bad. You need to go to youth group when you're bad. Let her worry about it. The reality is, what better place to be than where you can receive the word implanted? And so I want to just encourage you today as a parent, set the standard for your children that you are treasuring the word of God. And if it's missing, you do what you need to do to find it. It's like it won't do any good sitting on the coffee table to have a Bible. Well, I have a Bible. Wonderful. But I'm not superstitious. Carrying a Bible isn't going to help you. It's applying the word that helps you. Could you stand with me, please?